Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long term investor. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, we talk with Marco Papich, partner and chief strategist at Clock Tower Group and author of the book, Geopolitical Alpha. Our conversation with Marco focuses on macro trends and geopolitical dynamics happening around the world and what the implications may be for investors. From Russia to China to Latin America and beyond, Marco walks us through where the global macro risks and opportunities are in the market and how investors should think about investing and building portfolios in this environment. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion with Clock Tower Group's Marco Papich. Just one more thing before we start. Excess Returns has been growing a lot recently, and all of that is a result of the support from our loyal listeners and viewers. We just want to thank everyone who's taken the time to listen to us and for supporting us and allowing us to continue to reach more and more investors. If you have a minute to do it, we would ask one favor of you. If you have benefited from the podcast and could take the time to subscribe on YouTube or your preferred audio platform and to write a review, that would be greatly appreciated. Both are a big part of expanding the podcast and will allow us to continue to get great guests. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Marco, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Thank you guys for having me. So today we're going to talk about the geopolitical landscape, macro investing, and I think what some of the investing implications are of all of these things that we're going to talk about. Um, you know, is, in my opinion, I think like talking about macro investing is sort of like a double-edged sword. On the one hand, I think everything we're going to talk about is going to have an impact on economies and investors' portfolios. On the other hand, you can't make changes to your portfolio all the time. The predictions have to be right. And, you know, sometimes we have a hard time separating what's important from what is just noise, which is why I think talking to people like you and trying to help us understand all these things and the implications for investors um, is very important and what we're going to get to today. Awesome. Yeah, I'm stoked. I'm fired up. I'm caffeinated. Let's let's do it. Nice, nice. So, I mean, let's start at a very high level, like just before we get into any of the specifics, just from an investing perspective, you know, why should investors pay attention to geopolitical events and what, how do you determine what is important and what's not important from your perspective? Oh, that's a great question. So like, I mean, look, I, I come from a very structural school of thought. So very top down school. I learned my markets at BCA Research which is the world's oldest independent research firm focused on markets. It's based in Montreal since 1949. And BC Research taught me the macro approach to markets. It's very top down. And then I learned my political risk analysis from Stratfor, which is also a very structural top down uh, shop in terms of analysis. Um, and so the reason I say that is because you should only worry about geopolitics and politics when it undermines the fundamentals that you take for granted. So like, I assume that investors listening to this podcast are not, you know, as the big Lebowski quote would say, children who have wandered into an adult conversation. In other words, you're not investing based off of just whim or newspapers. You have a fundamental view of where the world is going. And so when something happens that's political or geopolitical in nature, you should only react to it and move against your net assessment and your fundamental thesis if it undermines the pillars of that thesis. And so that's why I think it's very important to have this, um, you know, Bayesian approach, which is just a fancy term for saying that you have certain priors that establish your probabilities of how the world is going to unravel. And then you only react when geopolitics or politics, you know, impacts those priors. Um, and I would argue that geopolitical alpha, which, you know, shameless plug is the title of my book, um, but geopolitical alpha is more difficult it is, is kind of like a, I mean, it's a sexy title for a book, but like the truth is almost all the time that I've been right in markets has been moving against geopolitical relevance. You know, I know a lot of, a lot of people find this surprising when they talk to me the first time, they're like, oh, he's a geopolitical guy. He's going to tell me how China, U S conflict matters, how Ukraine matters, how this matters, how that matters. And most of the time when I've had compelling geopolitical alpha views, it's because I pushed against the view that it matters. Because in the short term, in the short term, Jay Powell is so much more powerful than Vladimir Putin. And so I would argue that my entire book, which is really a framework for generating geopolitical alpha, is cute and sexy and useful and people should read it. But 
the truth behind being a successful investment strategist off of politics and geopolitics is finding geopolitical beta, which is getting those huge macro shifts that are driven by paradigm shifts in geopolitics and politics, um, where something that you've taken for granted for like a decade is suddenly undermined, you know? Um, and those come rarer than geopolitical offer opportunities, but I think they're more compelling. So is the alpha, th that was my next question, is how do you take these geopolitical events and actually generate alpha as an investor from them? So is it taking a contrarian or non-consensus view and then getting you know, that right? And that's where the alpha actually comes from? I would argue that most of the time, yes. And uh, like I, again, BCA research is a place that teaches you to respect the markets. So I'm the type of a person who, when the bond market does something that doesn't make sense or equity markets, um, the first thing I say is like, what is the bond market trying to tell us? I'm not like, oh, bonds are stupid. You know, like, no, 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 no. Respect the market. However, when I'm, uh, when I act as an investor, I do bet against the markets. Why? Because I do think there's a informational disadvantage. The median investor who has a CFA, who's gone through years of trading, um, just is still not up to speed with the geopolitical changes that have occurred over the last decade. You know, like, I mean, look, I'm, I'm not denigrating our, our peers. I'm just saying the CFA exam has absolutely nothing about politics or geopolitics, has absolutely no, no attempt to give us a framework. And so, yes, geopolitical alpha opportunities are those opportunities where the market overreacts. And I'll give you a good example this year. Um, that was very productive for me. Obviously, I'm giving you an example where I was right. Like, so there's many, 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 many examples where I'm wrong. But what happened this year with oil prices was a good indicator. You know, you've had this spike in the geopolitical risk premium in oil prices. Now, how can I say that with certainty? How can I measure it? Well, um, you know, I believe that there are ways to gauge oil price demand globally. I really like Chinese non-oil imports as a gauge of Chinese economy and its contribution to global demand. And that was falling off the cliff the entire year. Oil prices tend to be coincident on that chart uh, over the past decade. And suddenly they started spiking around April and May because of a reaction to perceived effectiveness of EU oil embargo against Russia. I argued that oil embargo was a PR effort by Europeans, the Westerners. No one was really going to embargo Russian oil. And so you had this chart where oil prices are going up Chinese contribution to global demand is cratering. So that was a way to say, okay, okay, the market is saying there's geopolitical risk premium. And then you have to do a geopolitical analysis and say, will the Ukraine war contribute to a loss of supply? My argument was no. And so I recommended to our clients that we short oil since May. It was wrong for a month and a half, really wrong. Prices went up. And then I tripled down on that call in June when it hit like $120 uh, dollar Brent. Now, that is a great example of where the market bets on something becoming a real risk and the fundamentals, the macroeconomic analysis, the demand side, which has nothing to do with geopolitics, by the way, or maybe it does because of Chinese zero COVID policy. But, you know, that was something we could read on a chart, like demand is falling through. People are just betting that geopolitics is going to be a big deal here. It's not. Uh, and I would argue that most geopolitical offer opportunities are like that. Why? Why aren't most opportunities uh, betting about risks? And so most, you know, most people, when they read like newspapers or stuff, they think that the way to trade geopolitics is to expect things to blow up. My concern with that, and the reason I, I tend to dis, dissuade my clients from doing that is that timing is so difficult. Like I have a view right now that Iran is the biggest problem. No one's watching. It's not in newspapers. Like, guys, there's going to be a war in the Middle East. But what do you do with it? Like, when does it happen, Marco? Well, I don't know. <laughs> you know, like, let me like check the air. Whereas when the risk is already priced in, when people have already lost their mind, when the Financial Times is bloviating about it, when it's on the economist's cover, ah, the market has spoken and you can bet against it. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, first off, the fact that you are the type of person that's, you know, saying, that, listen, some of your predictions are right, some of your predictions are wrong. I mean, that type of truthfulness and I think transparency is very important because investors need to understand this, this stuff is hard. It's hard to make these predictions and forecasts um, and get them right consistently. No one can do that. But how do you view, when you think about your forecasting and predictions, how do you view changing your mind when it comes to something? You know, because that's important. For the, the best forecasters are the ones that have the ability to look at something and say, you know what, something's changed here. And I need to change my view on it. So how do you go about thinking about I think that? it's very, very simple for me, you know. Um, <clears throat> What we do, what my team and I 
do and what I've done, what I've done when I train people on how to do this job is we produce net assessments, you know, and net assessments are effectively a way to gauge the constraints that matter on a particular topic. So let's say you want to, uh, we just produce one on Indonesia. I'm super bullish on Indonesia. I think Indonesia is doing a lot of things right. Our net assessment basically sets out a three to six factors, reasons why we are bullish or bearish on a particular issue. And so there's news flow, constant news flow. And it's funny because we wrote a piece on Indonesia that was mega bullish. And the next day, literally the next day, Indonesian uh, legislature banned, you know, um, sex out of wedlock. And so we had a lot of people asking us the question, like, hey, are you still bullish on Indonesia? And our argument is like, yes, we ignore all headlines that do not impact the, the factors that we've laid out as the reasons for why we're bullish. So that's what I would say. Like, you cannot have a, a like, you cannot change your view unless your view is based on fundamentals and on constraints and on a material reality. And so that's why um, a lot of times with news and headlines impact my view or move the prices, I don't react to them. I only change my view if it changes that original net assessment. I mean, I teach a course on this, like I, I teach investors how to like deal with this. It's very difficult because we're constantly inundated with this like social media and media narratives that whipsaw you back and forth, but you have to have an anchor. So Justin and I were talking before we started and we were kind of debating how we would open this. And, you know, I kind of said to him, you know, well, a great way to open this might be to say, all right, you know, there's way more going on in the geopolitical landscape than there ever is. But then he was saying back to me, he's like, you know what? That's always the case. Everybody always thinks there's more, you know, going on in the geopolitical landscape than there ever has been. So I'm wondering, you know, what, what do you think about that? Are there actually more things going on geopolitically right now than would, it would be in like a normal scenario? Okay, so there's a couple of ways to answer that question. First of all, I can empirically prove to you that we have more armed conflicts at this time than at any other time since World War II. I have a chart that shows that. And that was something that I've been predicting for the past 10 years, purely because I'm a failed political scientist. You know, like, uh, um, I study a lot of political scientists, uh, science. I wasn't good enough to be a prof. But I can tell you that if you're in a multipolar world where no one or two countries are in charge, it's like a schoolyard without bullies, there's going to be chaos. And that's what we have. So yes. So Jack, like, dude, like empirically speaking, we have more armed conflicts going on than ever. And there's a database run by Uppsala University in Sweden that proves this. However, I would say something else. It's not the quantity. It's the quality of the events that is creating high vol. And what I mean by that is that I would argue that the collapse of the Soviet Union, you know, in the early 90s, was actually much more momentous than the current moment. And, the, and I mean, that could have gone sideways off the rails very quickly. We could have had conflicts and warfare across the entire former communist world. Very few countries descended into conflict. You've had conflict in Moldova, had conflict in Azerbaijan, in Armenia, and my homeland, of Yugoslavia, which obviously you know, had this explosion of conflict. But like Soviet Union dissolution was like one of the most momentous moments in the 20th century, and it went smoothly. And I think that the difference, though, is that in the early 90s, when all of this stuff was going on, it was all positive. It was all moving in the same direction. So if you're an investor sitting in like 1989, 1990, 1991, you're like, oh my God, all these markets are moving. You know, like there's going to be so much opportunity. Capitalism is on the march. Laissez faire. The Reagan and Thatcher revolutions are taking over. The Washington consensus is spreading. This is incredible. And so while the volume was high and the volatility was high, everything was moving in our direction. And our, I mean, the epistemic community that we all belong to, which is, you know, investors. Now it's the exact opposite. So the volume uh, of changes is happening, but it's almost all pernicious. It's almost all negative. It's all, all a headwind to being an investor. And so I think that that's the difference. You mentioned this idea of a multipolar world. And, you know, for people like me who don't know a lot about this, it does seem like the world in the past has been dominated by big countries like the United States. And it seems like you're saying that might be changing. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that might be happening. You know, Jack, I've been talking about this for a decade, and I'm just uh, so happy that multipolarity is not like the word of 2022. Everyone's talking about it. You know, Vladimir Putin talks about it all the time. Xi Jinping talks about it all the time. American newspapers are starting to talk about it. So let's, let's break it down. What is it? Uh, in political science, international relations theory, like there is this view that, you know, you can create hegemonic stability through a unipolar system where one country is in charge. And by the way, the greatest uh, book on this is not a political scientist. It's actually an economic historian that many of 
uh, your listeners will be familiar with. So Charles Kindleberger wrote a great book called uh, The World at War. Uh, it's a really, really good book, and it talks about this hegemonic stability. And he, he basically argues that in the 1930s, the Great Depression was allowed to end, end in you know, tariffs, in trade protectionism, and eventually more because there was no single country to take the reins and provide the extremely expensive public goods of stability, lender of last resort, consumer of last resort, and so on. And so um, when the world has a single power, it means it's a unipolar world. And it doesn't have to be an American you know, hegemony. It can be Chinese. It can be, as I often joke, aliens can come and enslave us. As long as they allow us to trade, we'll love it because there is order. And we as investors can continue to take CFA exams they have nothing to do with politics and we can trade and we can invest because you know what the rules and norms are of behavior and you just apply them and that's it. So a unipolar system is an extremely stable system. It's like a schoolyard with a single bullet. Somebody goes out of line, boom, they get put in line. A bipolar world seems scary, right? Oh my God, two big bullies facing off, but actually it's pretty easy to model. Political science became very mathematical during the Cold War because game theory could be applied to this very simplistic model where there's two actors. Like Germany, West Germany didn't have a foreign policy, you know? Like France didn't get to do what it wanted. They tried. They tried, like deviated here and there, but most of the time if they deviated from American view, boom, they got slapped back into war. Same with the Soviet bloc. You know, Czechoslovakia started thinking freely, boom, there were tanks in Prague. Russian tanks in Prague. So the bipolar system is scarier, but it's also rules-based. A multipolar world, which I've been arguing we've been in for the last decade, most people did not think so. You know, 2012, 13, people still thought America was still in charge. A multipolar world is a world where it's every country for itself. And that creates interesting structural, systemic consequences. They have nothing to do with like American foreign policy. It's not about Donald Trump or Joe Biden. It's not about Xi Jinping. It's not about China. It's about system. The system is in a disequilibrium because each country pursues their foreign policy interests out of their own national interests, and they never get slapped by a bigger regional power, you know, by a, by a hegemon. And that creates these conflicts that just seem to spiral out of nowhere. Uh, and it's a very dynamic, very volatile situation, but it's also a situation where investors should remain calm and collected because it doesn't mean that every conflict leads to World War III, you know? So like we should stop reading like blogs that tell you like, oh, when this happens, this happens, this happens, World War III. No, no. In fact, things like Russia-Ukraine conflict, which is the closest we've gotten probably to World War III since the Cuban Missile Crisis, has these interesting outcomes where oil prices collapse. You know, like it's not what people necessarily think. Not every conflict is bad but conflicts will be of higher frequency and the world will be, um, will have more geopolitical volatility. Now I would argue it's also beneficial for investors. The late 19th century, early 20th century. So from about 1870, from the unification of Germany to the first world war, which, you know, was like almost 50 years. It was very tense. It was like, there were military alliances cropping up everywhere. There was a lot of balancing of power. It was a very multipolar volatile world. But it also gave us the probably greatest source of innovation in technology that we ever had. It was exciting to be an investor at the time. New markets were being opened. There was collusion. There was like intrigue. There was exciting stuff going on because that multipolar competition created dynamism and created interesting outcomes that actually allowed investors to, to be quite profitable if they embraced the geopolitical volatility and learned how to play it. It would seem to me like a world where everybody's sort of a little bit more on their own would be more inflationary. I mean, obviously, globalization has been a huge deflationary force. I mean, am, am I right about that? Of course. Yes. Um, but, but here's the good news about multipolarity, which is very counterintuitive. It, there's not a linear relationship between distribution of power in the world and globalization. In other words, it doesn't go like multipolarity is the least globalized. Bipolarity is a little bit more globalized. Unipolarity is the most globalized. There's a kink in this curve. And this is something that people really struggle to wrap their brains around. A unipolar world is clearly the most, you know, globalized. A single hegemon says, hey, here's the rules, follow them or we'll bomb you. You know, and then people follow those rules. A bipolar world is actually the least globalized, is the least, because you have this bifurcation of capitalism. And I, I would argue that most 
armchair analysts today and op-ed writers are saying that we're in a cold war. We're in a bipolar world, China, US. No, we're not. We're, we're not. not. The two countries are not strong enough to, co to enforce compliance amongst their allies. If they were, if we did have a bi bifurcated world, we would have a lot less globalization, Jack. You would be, you know, that would be 100%. But we actually have this interesting dynamic where the multipolar environment causes enemies to trade with one another. It's strange. Why? Because they're afraid their own allies will cheat. That happened in the 19th century, happened in the 20th century. In the interwar period, it's happening now. In game theory, a lot of formal modeling in political science game theory proves that in a multipolar environment, enemies will end up trading with one another. So globalization mm -hmm. is preserved. So, so I actually think globalization will continue to um, provide a dif disinflationary force. However, where you're right that multipolarity leads to inflation is that countries start wanting redundancy, right? Just in case. So instead of just in time inventories, we want just in case inventories. And so that's where we get this inefficiency where countries start saying like, mm, do I really want all of my pharmaceuticals produced in India and China? And then like, you know, like, do I really want all of my supply chain in China? And that just in case inventory rebalancing causes the uh, inflationary outcomes. Also, the other thing is that in a multipolar world, the government comes back. So we had this unipolar moment by America where American government withdrew itself from the economic world, from the economy. Uh, Laissez-faire literally means that, leave it be. We now have a much more dirigist economic capitalism. And that's not just in America. It's, not, it's like the CHIPS Act, the Inflation Reduction Act. All these acts are basically industrial policy where the US, is, US government is coming back and saying like, hey, we want you to build this. Here's some money. Go do it. That creates inefficiency. Um, I'm not saying it's necessarily bad. We will probably have innovation, even if it's states driven, but it, when every country does it, it will create redundancies, inefficiencies, and it will be inflationary in the near term for sure. For the next five years, I don't see how we get under, you know, 3% CPI in a non, in a non recessionary quarters. One of the first things people tend to do when we have inflation is kind of look back to the last time we did in the 1970s. And, you know, we've had a lot of investment guests who have sort of talked about the differences between the 70s and now from an investment standpoint. But I'm wondering from a geopolitical standpoint, how do you compare and contrast what was going on with the 70s from what's going on now? Well, that's that's where I think I think uh, it's a poor comparison. And listen, I've made it myself, you know, like I've made this comparison myself over and over again. But I've, I've thought about it a little bit more over the past six, 12 months. Um, you know, in 2019, I was using 1970s a lot. I thought we were getting into 1970s. So even before COVID, that was my anchor. Um, the thing, the difference is that one, we're in a multipolar world. Globalization is not going to zero. 1970s, you guys got to remember, 30% of humans on the planet, 30% lived in capitalism. 30%. That was it. Now it's like 95. And you know, like the Western media propaganda, anti-China bias is like, oh, they're going back to Maoism. No, they're not. Like, yeah, they're just redistributing wealth a little bit more. Like China's still some form of capitalism. It is. So you've got 95% of humans on the planet in a capitalist society. And it might come down a little bit. They might be blocked off in, in terms of protectionism. But the amount of globalization today is much, much greater than it was in the 70s. And even though it's marginally reversing, and that's marginally inflationary, so we agree, it's just not going to go back to the levels of the 1970s. The second issue is that we are going back away from laissez-faire, for sure. The Reagan Thatcher revolution are dead. We're going to something else. We're going towards more dirigist capitalism, but we don't have like unions and like having, you know, wage inflation indexing. Like we're not there. We're not there. And we're not there because again, uh, a global labor pool is still globalized to an extent. So everything is marginally reversing from the good times of the nineties, but we're not going back to the seventies. There's still disinflationary forces. They're going to keep inflation from just blowing out. Uh, the, so, so I don't think that that's a good comparison. I would argue a better comparison is the late 40s, early 50s, where inflation spiked to double digits, but came back much faster. It didn't require as much of an effort by central banks um, as it did in the 1970s. And the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s were interesting because there was a second world war, which can be an analog for COVID. There was a dislocation of manufacturing and supply and demand produced by returning baby boomers, you know, like GIs coming back, uh, wanting to start families, wanting everything, fridges, this and that, like houses, and there wasn't enough. 
And so there was this inflationary spike that was actually resolved relatively quickly. Uh, but it did have an impact on bonds and equities and so on. So I'm not saying that we should like ignore it. I just don't think it'll take a decade to get us down uh, below like 8%. And I think, the, I think the outcome that's most likely for the rest of this decade is where we struggle to get under 2% mandate to the central bank. Uh, we don't really blow out over 5% CPI for the rest of the decade. So we come back to somewhere between 3 and 6%. Now, you know, that sounds like, oh, it's not that bad. But like if you're a pension fund, that's still terrible. <laughs> like you're overloaded with bonds, which are not pricing 3 to 6% CPI over the last next seven years. I want to shift and talk about the two major conflicts everybody's thinking about right now. You know, obviously Ukraine and, and China seem to be the two biggest things on people's minds. And, you know, just thinking back to the start of the Ukraine thing, you know, I know when I was looking at it and when I woke up that morning and, Ru and Russia had invaded, I was really shocked. You know, I didn't think, I think everybody kind of thought, you know, they're going to go to the brink. They're not going to do it. Um, did people in, in your space, the geopolitical analysts, see, think the same thing? And if so, you know, why did, why did Putin decide to go ahead and do it when a lot of people thought he wouldn't? Well, you know, the U.S. intelligence nailed, intelligence nailed it. <laughs> they were telling everyone it's going to happen. Um, it was the intelligence agencies of Europe, of Ukraine itself, <laughs> that got it wrong. Um, and um, I would say, that, I mean, I got it wrong too. I assign a very low probability, very low, like 2%. I think this is the biggest political miss of my career, geopolitical an analysis miss of my career. I assigned, I think, 2 or 3% to the type of invasion that ended up happening. So I assigned 50% to some form of a, you know, intervention, uh, more limited, like to Donbass. Um, but like the full invasion of all of Ukraine? No. Why? Well, because, you know, my view was that that was really stupid and that Russia would lose if they did that. Uh, um, you know, I thought maybe they could get to Kiev pretty quickly, uh, but that the Ukrainians would fight back and that they would win because Ukraine is three times the size of Iraq, doubles, double the population. And unlike Iraq, you know, you're facing a population that's almost completely hostile to the Russians. Uh, when Americans went into Iraq, one of the things that we forget is that 80% of the population welcomed the U.S. I mean, that, you know, that turned sour very quickly, uh, but 80% were not Shias, sorry, not Sunnis. Saddam Hussein, of course, is a Sunni dictator running a country that's 60% Shia, 20% Kurd. And so Americans initially had a very easy time carving through Iraq like, like knife through butter. The Russians were never going to have that. Plus, they invaded the country with 150, 180,000 troops. They sliced those troops into 12 different vectors, which meant that each vector was about 20,000 troops. It was idiotic. It was like made-for-TV Hollywood thing. They thought they were going to just walk in. Ukrainians were going to roll over. It is inconceivable how stupid that is. You know, like, I, I really can't, like, in my time as a geopolitical analyst, I've never seen uh, a military decision taken with such stupidity. So, so that's why I think a lot of, like, the, the intelligence agencies that were much closer to Russia actually got it wrong because they knew how poorly trained the Russians were and poorly equipped and how idiotic this was. Um, now, once it happened, though, and this is, I think, the power of the framework that I employ. Once it happened, a lot of people who got it wrong then overestimated Russian willingness to fight. You know, and this is where you have to really be anchored in material reality. My view for why the probability of invading Ukraine was so low was because I thought Russians would get their ass kicked if they did it. Uh, a more limited incursion would have been much more beneficial for them. So once they made that mistake, I didn't adjust my forecast. I didn't say Putin was crazy. I didn't say that he was going to, you know, do whatever and use nukes. I said, no, they're going to get their asses kicked and they're going to limit their goals. They're going to change their goals. And that's where material constraints and, and not relying on like thinking what policymakers are thinking or what their preferences are, you know, like, what does Putin want? Like, who cares what he wants? Like, what do I want? Who cares what I want? You know, you focus on what you can achieve. And that's where that constraint-based framework really helped because it allowed me then to say like, wait a minute, this is going to go really bad. They're going to have to adjust their goals, which they did on March 25th when they withdrew from all of Northern Ukraine. And they re refocused their efforts on Donbass, on land bridge to Crimea and on Kherson. And that's where they're right now. Uh, that's where the Russians are actually doing okay. Uh, despite the Western media obsession with the Ukrainian offensive, that offensive has stalled. You know, we, we are so focused on Ukrainian successes. But if you actually look at the map of reconquered territory, it's not that impressive. 
since the summer, the Ukrainian offensive has done well. I think it surprised many, it surprised me, but it hasn't actually done as much as maybe the perception is. And that just shows you how difficult it is to play offense for countries like Ukraine and Russia. They can both play defense. Offense is more difficult. And so what I would say is that we're reaching a point in the war where we're entering stasis and where it's likely going to peter out. Uh, I think offensives are going to continue to fail. The Russians are just not, they're running out of weapons, literally. The Ukrainians are not being given offensive weapons on purpose because the West actually does not want Ukraine to threaten core interests to Russia. And this is something that the Western press doesn't talk about. We don't talk about it because it's politically incorrect. But the truth is the Ukrainians have not been given the kind of weapons that would make a big difference on offense. On defense, yes. And so where, where I think this goes is over the next six months, it will continue to be less and less relevant by the markets. And by the way, the market agrees with me. Since June, all the geopolitical risk has absolutely drained out of commodities and other geopolitical safe haven assets. When we talk about some of the outcomes that the markets might care about, some of the terrible stuff that you see people saying out there, you know, nuclear weapons might be used at some point or NATO might be drawn in. I mean, do you think any of that is high likelihood? No, I think that NATO will not be drawn in. I think that's just inconceivable. Nuclear weapon use. Um, so there is a scenario where I would say that it could rise in probability. Uh, imagine a scenario where the Ukrainians perform a blitzkrieg, take all of Kherson, which is the oblast, a province right above Crimea, and then start threatening Crimea itself. Uh, the Russians, the Russian rhetoric, uh, President Putin's rhetoric is that every piece of conquered territory is Russia. That's not true. And they're not acting like it. The Russians themselves don't believe it. But Crimea, they do believe it's Russian. You know, so if the Ukrainian offensive st starts threatening Crimea, I do think the Russians will actually start, you know, calling up capitals around the West and saying like, no, look, we are going to use nukes. Um, the West knows this, you know, which is why the West has not given Ukraine the weapons it would need for that kind of a blitzkrieg. What the Ukrainians need are main battle tanks like the Leopard 2s that the Germans produce or the Abrams that the U.S. produces. They also need ground assault aircraft, uh, such as the A-10 Warhawks, which the U.S. has plenty of. Um, they're basically mothballed, and the U.S. could give Ukraine 100 of these. We could train Ukrainians over the course of six months, and they could have a very, very potent uh, offensive capability. But none of that has been happening over the last 10 months. Every time you read a, a newspaper and it cites some figure, like the Biden administration gives Ukraine 800 million, 2 billion, 7 billion, 3 billion, whatever. It's all inconsequential weapons as far as the offensive capabilities of Ukraine are concerned. This is by design. It's not a bug. It's a feature of Western support of Ukraine because the West understands that giving Ukrainians offensive weapons could lead to this very pernicious outcome where the Russians feel like their national like security interests are being threatened. Uh, so I think that this is a key important, you know, I get a lot of questions from clients, like when is President Zelensky going to sit down and negotiate? And I say, I don't care. That's, that's not a market relevant answer. It's not a market relevant question. The question is, when does the military equilibrium get established? Not when the political equilibrium emerges. And so I would argue we're already at that military equilibrium in part because the West hasn't armed Ukraine for offensive operations and the Russians just can't play offense because they're terrible at it. One of the things I've learned in sort of following this is there's, there's a difference between nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons. Um, you know, there, there are different types of them. You know, there's like the obliterate the world ones and then there's other ones. So I'm just wondering, can you talk a little bit about what that is and sort of the difference between them? Well, tactical nuclear weapons are used to, um, to break up large, uh, large formations of, of mechanized units. So tactical nuclear weapons were developed during the Cold War primarily to arrest a tank attack by the Soviets against the West. So the Americans actually never had no first use policy. You know, the Soviets kind of did. Uh, it's, it's a little bit murky, but the Soviets effectively said like, look, we'll never use nuclear weapons first. And the reason they had that posture is because they felt very confident they could, um, you know, win in a conventional war against NATO because they had such an overwhelming tank superiority. Uh, the Americans said, no, we will use some tactical nuclear weapons. You come through that Fulda gap outside of Frankfurt with your tanks. We're using a tactical nuclear weapon to destroy your tank brigades and tank units. Um, so, you know, like that's what a tactical nuclear weapon would be used for. 
Uh, in this case, Ukrainians are not attacking with large mechanized forces. You know, so tactical nuclear weapon would really just be intimidation. It wouldn't have like a tactical purpose. It wouldn't have a purpose of arresting a Ukrainian offensive. I don't think because Ukrainian offensive is not like you don't have a mass of units coming in in like a spear. Uh, it would really be used just to intimidate the Ukrainians and to um, use a, a nuclear weapon with a yield low enough to kind of signal to the West, like, hey, guys, we're not trying to like destroy a whole city. We're not trying to obliterate Kiev. We're trying to tell Ukrainians we're serious that the Crimea is Russia. You know, like we can go back and forth. You hear Sons, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Luhansk, but if you touch Crimea, we're using nuclear weapons. Uh, the Russians haven't done that. They haven't made this explicitly clear. They're just kind of like hinting and throwing out stuff to just scare people and intimidate. But yes, you are right. There are different nuclear weapons used for different purposes. In this case, it wouldn't be used for its original purpose. It would be used to kind of intimidate and say like, hey, you know, like we will stop at nothing uh, to preserve certain parts. Now, I'm guessing, it's my speculation, that the Russians would do this if Crimea was threatened. Uh, I'm speculating. I'm assuming the American intelligence and defense officials are speculating the same thing, which again is why we haven't armed Ukrainians with the weapons necessary for Blitzkrieg. And by the way, just yesterday or two days ago, Wall Street Journal revealed that the HIMARS artillery Americans sent to Ukraine had like a software patch. Did you guys read about this? Software patch to limit where the rockets could go. So in other words, the Americans gave Ukrainians artillery that was like, they had a block for where they could shoot those artillery pieces. Americans are controlling the space that the Ukrainians can, can, can attack. And, and that's because everyone's concerned that Ukraine might actually win and then not stop at sort of a, a place where the Russians would be comfortable with. But going back to your point about an equilibrium, I mean, do you think the end game here is this is just really going to drag on for a really, really long time without a resolution one way or the other? We're, we're at that point, Jack. I think we've been at an equilibrium more or less uh, for the past several weeks. Uh, and I, you know, the Korean War ended without really a peace deal. You know, it just ended because the two sides were exhausted and there was a line of control established that was very difficult and very costly to move across. So I do think we're approaching that level. You know, we have this um, image in our heads of capitulation. We have this image of the Japanese on the American aircraft carrier signing a capitulation of Hitler, like blowing his brains out outside of a bunker. Those are, those are the wars we anchor ourselves to. But many wars end through a military equilibrium that establishes itself before politicians agree to the end of the war. The Bosnian civil war is a good example. Um, Moldova conflict that carved out part of Moldova Azerbaijan and Armenia until 2020 was in a military equilibrium for like 30 years. And I think that we're reaching a point where both the Russians and Ukrainians are exhausted. Now, we're not there yet. I think the Russians are going to try a couple more offensives. But look, I mean, they, they recruited 100, 200,000 troops that are poorly trained, poorly equipped. If they couldn't do offensive operations against Ukrainians in March of 2022, why would they be able in March of 2023 when they're going to have less weapons, less veterans, less well-trained troops. So I think the Russian offensives will fail over the course of the next three to six months. And I think Ukrainian offensives will continue to actually surprise to the downside from this point. Um, we're, we're, you know, like this is not what the Western media is going to tell you because we're all cheering for Ukraine. The Russians are going to tell you this because they're still chest beating for domestic political purposes. But I look at the map and I'm like, I don't know, the front hasn't really moved that much over the, since September, since the Ukrainians won in Kharkiv. It's kind of been what it is, you know? And so I think that for the next decade, for the rest of this decade, these borders will be kind of unofficial de facto borders and they won't be accepted by Kiev. Kiev will never accept these borders. And God bless them. That's, you know, that's their prerogative. And the Russians will not accept like giving it back, even if Putin somehow is no longer in charge. Going back to the idea Justin talked about, about non-consensus views. I mean, do you think there's anything in terms of what's going on in Ukraine or the way this might end that the market's getting wrong? I mean, do you think there's anything that's mispriced based on this? Well, I mean, obviously earlier this year, it was a lot of the geopolitical risk premium in the commodity markets. I think at this point, if I was going to bet against anything, uh, it would be uh, Euro bearishness and uh, European deep recession. Because I think, look, if I'm right and there's a, you know, I mean, it's a low conviction of you. We, wars are unpredictable. So just, this is a caveat. But if I'm correct, and this war is effectively over in three to six months, you know, they're still fighting. People are still dying, unfortunately. But effectively, we're not moving anywhere else. 
I think what the market is completely mispricing is that the Russians will, at some point, no longer have an interest in not making money off of natural gas sales to Europe. You know, at some point, I think the Russians are going to say, like, wait, why are we not making $50 billion a year? Um, wh like, why? Like, we actually need the money. <laughs> you know, we underestimated how long this war is going to last. We underestimated how expensive it's going to be and how much our butts are going to get kicked by the Ukrainians. Um, we underestimated how much oil prices are going to go down as did entire financial Twitter, but let's leave that aside. Like, you know, like I think the Russians were reading too much Golden Stacks. Maybe they were investing with Bridgewater. I don't know, but they got the oil call wrong. And so now they're sitting at $60. You know, the rent is at 80, they get a 20, $30 discount. Like, you know, they're lucky if the Indians are giving them 50 bucks a barrel. They were making 120 early in the war. They were chest beating. They were like, look at the ruble, baby. You know, they were, they were, they were riding high. The Russians thought they were going to crush this. And now they're like, oh man, that barrel's at 50 bucks. I'm going to need those natural gas sales to Europe. So what I think the market is mispricing is this pessimism about Europe. I think Europe crushed this comp, actually. And I think there's been way too much bearishness. I think the Europeans, you know, obviously made a ton of mistakes leading up to the conflict. Ton of mistakes, ton of mistakes. But once the conflict happened, they actually crushed it. And one of the things that the Russians mistook is that Europeans have the most powerful military weapon known to man. It's called printing a reserve currency. So what the Europeans have done is they printed a bunch of euros and just elbowed out China and India for their LNG and forced the Chinese to go back to coal, forced the, Chi uh, the Indians to go to coal. They forced the Japanese to restart their nuclear power plants. A lot of people are not talking about this, but Japan restarting nuclear power plants is going to give Europeans another 12 BCM. They're just going out buying every cargo of LNG, you know, with printed euros. And the Russians are like, oh man, that sucks because they can print longer than we can stay solvent. And so I think that's something that is probably mispriced. I think at some point, Russians go hat in hand back to Europe and say like, hey man, do you want this gas? And Europeans were like, yeah, let's, let's take the gas for the next two years and we'll build out our LNG capacity by 2024 to take this tsunami of LNG that's coming online by 2024, 2025. And so the counterintuitive way to play this would be to go long European industrials which have basically priced like some sort of feudal medieval deindustrialization, which is just not going to happen in Europe. I want to shift and talk briefly about China. You know, there's been a lot of stuff with China in the news. You had, you had a former leader being escorted out of a conference. We had Taiwan, you know, we had Nancy Pelosi visiting Taiwan. We had the Chips Act. I'm wondering if you could just talk at a high level how you're thinking about what's going on in China. So I think, uh, uh, you know, like the high level is that China had an election year, for more or less, if we can use that term. Uh, Congress was really important. Xi Jinping was trying to do something unprecedented, extend his term, right? Uh, hasn't happened in sort of last 20 years. And so uh, political volatility in China was at a very high level. And politics took precedence over economics. So everything, like we in the West, were looking at what's going on in China. We're like, why are you not stimulating? Why are you crushing real estate? Why are you doing zero COVID? But they were, they were, put, they were, um, they were putting political goals ahead of economics. And so now that Congress is over, now that the election is over, and now that Xi Jinping has loaded the Politburo Standing Committee with his allies, you're seeing the speed with which they're pivoting on all of these issues, on TMT regulation, on real estate crackdown, on zero COVID, and on the use of PBUC to fiscally stimulate uh, through provincial fiscal spending. So they restarted a very important uh, liquidity facility called the PSL two months ahead of Congress. Which to us was a real signal that like, hey, they're going to shift massively after, after this quote unquote election is over, they're going to focus on pro-growth uh, policies. So I think that the shift in China is dramatic. What, what's happening in China? I mean, what's happening in China is kind of what's happening everywhere else in the world. They are moving away from less fair capitalism. True. That's what common prosperity is about. I don't think it's like a return to Maoism. It's simply what we're all doing. By the way, we're all abandoning kind of the tenets of Reagan and Thatcher revolution. And we're all adopting more redistributory capitalist policies. So that's the one thing that's happening. The second thing that's happening is that they are, um, you know, they are focusing their economic development on more hard tech and on more things that are going to matter over the next decade. And they're abandoning kind of the software and the tech um, innovation that led China over the last decade. So that's why they've gone after the TMT sector. Or trying to boost things like EVs and batteries, defense, um, semiconductors, domestic, and so on. 
Uh, so China is uh, recalibrating it, its economic growth model, and it's, uh, it's also recalibrating the kind of capitalism it's employing. Uh, so I think 2023 will be a great year for Chinese assets and for Chinese economy. They're going to have this huge pop. Everything's going to be great. Chinese equities are probably going to be the best performers in the world. Um, but the problem is that structurally, they still face a lot of headwinds. The demographics is a well-known thing. I don't have to talk about it. I think the bigger issue is leverage. They've leveraged themselves so much. The private sector is so massively leveraged um, that you're going to see households basically take a break for a decade. Like private sector in China is not going to be a source of growth. And what that means for policymakers in China is that they're in a very dangerous spot. They're going to continue to depend on exports and actually imported capital through FDI. And so that means they have to play nice with the rest of the world. And so the dynamic I expect over the next half a decade, or about five years, is a counterintuitive one. I actually think America is going to be very aggressive. It's going to continue to launch Nancy Pelosi missiles, you know? And I think the Chinese are going to have to kind of take it and uh, be much more subdued because their domestic uh, growth engine is not sufficient to give them the kind of growth. They're going to have to depend on the rest of the world continuing to trade with them. And that constrains Chinese policymakers massively. So I don't expect a war over Taiwan. I don't expect an aggressive foreign policy with Southeast Asia or anything else. Uh, but I expect U.S. to be quite aggressive and continue with its aggressive foreign policy, essentially to try to get China to make a mistake. Um, because that then resolves America's problem, which is that the rest of the world just doesn't agree with America that China's a threat. So the U.S. has to solve that problem somehow. And the easiest way to do that is to provoke China into making a, a, a serious error. There's two more quick things on China before I hand it back to Justin. One is the sort of a doomsday scenario, like I asked about in Ukraine. You know, a lot of people are out there saying maybe there's a better chance than people expect that China will invade Taiwan at some point, And that if they did, that would be a catastrophic outcome for market. I was wondering if you could comment quickly on what, what your thoughts are on that. I mean, I think it'll be a catastrophic event for China. You know? I don't think it would be catastrophic for the markets. I think there's always winners and losers. And that's one of the things that I always try to emphasize. Geopolitical risks, I hate that term. You know, it's geopolitical risks and opportunities. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is the, the probability of that is low, and I think it's falling. You know, it's falling because I think the, the Chinese realize how difficult it is to play offense. They watch Russians basically get crushed in Ukraine. Taiwan is an island, by the way. It's like more easy. It's easier to defend. Uh, yeah, China has military capability to flatten Taiwan, to turn it into a parking lot. Facts. True. But like to what end? You know, um, the second issue is that China has vulnerabilities. As I just said, their domestic growth engine is, is done. Like they are facing secular stagnation. They're facing what America faced from 2010 onwards. Like the, the private sector is deleveraging for the rest of this decade. So they are now addicted to exports again. And so they need the goodwill of the rest of the world. And if you invade Taiwan, America will be proven correct. You know, American hyperbolic bloviations about China threat, which most of the rest of the world thinks Americans are crazy, by the way, except for a couple of U.S. allies like India, Australia, Japan. The rest of the world is like, okay, bro, like, cool it. Well, you know what? If Chinese invade Taiwan, then America pro is proven correct. And then everyone's going to like run to America and say like, okay, we're sorry, you were right. And then you will have a unified front against China, which will destroy China's economy. You know, and so that's a real risk for China that I think policymakers understand. I think Beijing watched very carefully how quickly the world united against Russia. I think what they were most concerned about was the way social media canceled Russia. You know, the White House wasn't out there calling McDonald's and um, like, you know, like car companies to get out of Russia. They did it on their own. Like the moment the Russians crossed that border, it was like the world canceled Russia. And I think the Chinese realized, wow, that could happen to us. So that's a huge constraint. The other constraint is more military and geographical. You know, if, um, if China invades Taiwan, I mean, the U.S. doesn't have to defend Taiwan. It just has to interdict Chinese oil supplies. And it has the naval superiority to do that. So then three, six months later, the Chinese are rowing back and forth across the Taiwanese Straits. So there are, there are real problems for China if they pursue this path. And so I don't think they will. I think that they're actually going to launch a charm offensive. They've been doing that for the last couple of weeks, especially with Europe. And I think they're going to try to convince the rest of the world that Americans are just mean, you know, 
this is going to be the Chinese play. Like, yo, we're, we're, we're nice. We're not doing anything wrong here. You know, oh, we built some chi uh, islands in the middle of South China Sea. Like, oh, come on. That was so 2015, you know? Um, we just increased beach property space. Come on. So I think that, you know, that's the big play the next five years. America's going to try to poke China into making a mistake and usher in a bipolar world. And the Chinese want to maintain a multipolar world that gives them a chance to continue to grow. And then the last one I want to ask you about is the CHIPS Act. You know, it seems like people like me who don't know a lot about this are focusing on things like Taiwan. And it seems like people in the know are maybe focusing more on the CHIPS Act. It's something that's much more important. I'm wondering if you, if you agree with that and what you think the implications of that are. So, no, I've, I've written a lot of research on this um, and I've thought a lot about it. I'm not an expert in semiconductors, but, you know, I stayed at a Holiday Inn. Like, just kidding. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, look, I mean, I, if you actually read the uh, fine print of the um, Commerce Department uh, order, it really targets a very small sliver of trade with China. It impacts China's ability to produce AI. And the way I say it is AI shmei. You know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, maybe I'm a Luddite, but I haven't seen AI make any mark, any real impact to my life other than Netflix being able to give me uh, a cool recommendation. Like just facts, you know, driverless cars. Okay, cool. It's 2023, guys. Like, where are they? What am I getting at? Getting at this very, very important thing that everybody ignores. There's a war in Ukraine going on right now. And... There's not a single semiconductor in a single piece of technology being used in that war that's smaller than 40 nanometers. Like, let's just be real here, okay? All this stuff is maybe going to be relevant to 2035. But what the October 7 Commerce Department order is it basically destroys China's ability to produce extremely sophisticated chips that they might one day need in some scenario for like, you know, autonomous swarms of drones, you know, against an American uh, highly sophisticated military. In other words, the Chinese are fine. Their national security is fine. And they can flatten Taiwan with weapons produced in the 80s and 90s. So the conflict in Ukraine is being fought, you know, with weapons produced in the 80s and 90s. HIMARS artillery was developed in the 80s. The javelins were produced in the 80s. None of this stuff is sophisticated. And so um, I think China's just going to take it. I think the allies of the U.S. are going to whine. They're going to kick and scream, but they're going to eventually comply. But they're going to tell Americans, like, look, this is the last one. Do not increase the size of chips that you're banning. Don't go from 16 nanometers higher because then we're not going to comply. And so I think that this Chips Act is relevant, but I think this is where it stops. I think this is going to be where this particular conflict like moves into other spheres. So I, I would expect more Commerce Department orders on pharma, on trading in public equities and private investment in China. But we're probably at the end of this particular one. I want to go back to your point about Europe. What's interesting with a lot of European equities is, you know, they're trading at, I mean, all multiples are down this year. Um, assuming we can have confidence in the earnings of the multiples, but assuming we can, you know, European stocks look a lot cheaper, you know, than at least U.S. stocks um, do right here. So I'm wondering, you know, what other parts of the world look attractive from, an, a, a, I guess, a value, you know, given the valuations and given what the economies might do in the next 12 to 24 months? That's the first part of the question. And then if you were if you were building like your own global equity portfolio, what would that look like today? for the next, let's say, 24, 12 to 24 months. 12 to 24 months. Okay, so first of all, I think Japan is really interesting and compelling. You've had this huge decline in the yen. So that creates uh, like a coiled spring where equities should rally thanks to depreciated currency. Uh, but Japanese equities haven't been able to really do that for most of 2022 because their number one trade partner, China, had a recession for all intents and purposes. So I also like Japan. Um, I think Japan and Europe could have the most upside over the next six months, especially if the dollar peaks. I mean, that would help as well. Now, um, in terms of the next 24 months, let's take 24 months instead of 12. On the next 24 month time horizon, I do agree with the uh, sort of commodity super cycle thesis. I just think a lot of investors got it wrong this year. We had a six month interregnum, you know, but it's, but it's not a reason to like dump commodities. Um, and so I think that commodities are going to have good 24 months. And what I, the way I would want to play it is emerging markets, 
that are commodity producers. So I really like Latin America. It's been my main kind of bullish view since, since 2020, really. There was a delay, like for most of 2021, Latin American uh, assets did not follow commodity prices, but they caught up this year. And I continue to think that Latin America really is a continent that is driven by terms of trade. Politics kind of doesn't matter. Karl Marx could rise from the grave, run one of those countries, and you should buy the assets if terms of trade are improving. You know, this is, this is what I learned over the last decade, kind of trying to invest and think about it, Latin America. So I like Latin America. I like other commodity producers, whether it's South Africa, whether it's Indonesia. Uh, I think they're going to do very well. Um, and I think that the next 24 months are really going to belong to emerging markets. Now, a lot of things have to happen for that. The Chinese have to put a floor in growth. I have a high conviction of you that are going to do that, that they're doing that. Uh, and the second thing is that the Fed does have to back off. Um, you know, it's funny, we've talked for an hour and we haven't really mentioned Jay Powell, except when I said at the beginning, he's more powerful than Vladimir Putin. He really is. And so we need to get a sense from the Fed that uh, it's sensitive to not breaking the whole world apart to get us to 2%. Um, I think CPI has peaked, high conviction view. I think CPI is going to go down to 4 or 5% over the next six months, no matter what the Fed does. So I do think the Fed is going to allow real yields to stop appreciating. And that's what the pivot is. The pivot is not monetary policy. The pivot is not what the, the Fed does, like with QE, QT, or, or interest rates. The pivot is just, will the Fed be okay if the real yield just goes sideways or comes down? Are they going to be okay with that? And if the answer is yes, then they've pivoted. You know, that's why this, this is a semantic debate. Uh, but I think a combination of the Fed being okay with real yields not appreciating like they've been shot out of uh, a rocket and the Chinese fiscal pivot, those two are going to create a really interesting setup for emerging markets over the next two years. And, and that really reminds me of 2016, by the way. If, if there's anything that I would say about the current macro setup, it would be that, you know, it's very similar to that January 2016. You got the Shanghai Accord, the Fed paused for 10 months on its uh, hiking path, and China put in, um, put in a bottom in growth with its shantytown redevelopment stimulus, which was really significant. So I think that's where we are. What's interesting is we had Rob Arnott from Research Affiliates uh, on the podcast about show us your portfolio. And he's, you know, he's pounding the table on emerging market value stocks, just given what he expects, uh, you know, next, I don't know, five to 10 years of returns to look like. That's where the, you know, the upside opportunity is. Well, and I would agree. I would, I would say value over growth everywhere, but just be careful with that because over the next three months, I can see NASDAQ going through the roof. You know, I can see growth doing well in this interregnum in the bond sell-off. So I, uh, I've been long duration since October. I had very low conviction on a lot of things. My view that Jay Powell would pivot was just late. It wasn't happening. You know, it was just like, he, he kept like hearing me on CNBC and being like, oh yeah, screw you, Marco. I'm not being <laughs> this much, you know? Uh, and then, and then, so, so one of the things I had a very high conviction view was that the tenure over 4% didn't make sense. It would rally. Uh, both because either you have recession risk and then the tenure has to rally or j Powell pivots and then the tenure will rally as the front end comes down. So that's happened. And I just think that for the next three months, that could continue to happen and you can have this growth stock burst. And what I tell investors is like, look, you own some tech, you own some growth stocks, good for you. Use the next three months to sell that because we're not moving from this CapEx driven inflationary cycle. We're not moving from it. And what I think is going to be interesting is in six months when we are in four to 5% CPI and then we stay there and we don't budge. And that's going to be the moment with the Fed. And by the way, at 4%, 5% CPI, there will be no political pressure to reduce it to two. Mm -hmm. Zero political pressure. What's the problem with 5% inflation? What's the wage growth at? What are the real wages going to be at 5% CPI? They're going to be flat. People are going to be happy. Like corporates are going to be happy. They got a pricing power. Consumers are going to be happy. Flush with cash, good wage growth. So at that point, how much political pressure will be there on the Fed to reduce it to 2%? The cost of that will be enormous. It's a calamitous recession. Millions of people will lose their jobs for some academic argument that 2% is better than 4 No way. And when the market realizes that, when the market realizes that we're not going to 2% anytime soon, and that everyone's kind of happy with four, that's when the tech stocks, growth stocks, and bonds are going to get absolutely murdered. And that's where, you know, value guys are going to win. 
to you, you. One of the things we haven't talked about is, um, you know, coming off the financial crisis, a lot of like debt moved off of the consumer balance sheets over to government balance sheets. And, you know, servicing that debt in the long run is a big financial burden for all countries, including the U.S. So, I mean, when, when, if ever, do markets sort of wake up to that and realize that that is a potential problem? Or is this just everyone has it, so we all got to deal with it? And maybe the U.S., even though we have a shitload of debt, we're the, still the best house in a bad neighborhood. I mean, is that something you think about and you're concerned about or what are your feelings? Yeah, no, I've, I, I think so. You had a preview of that with the U.K. The bond market showed you, you know, and, and what did the U.K. do? They just said, OK, cool, we're going to anchor the tenure. I didn't say it, but they did it. And everyone's telling me like, Marco, no, you don't understand. It's like the pension system in the U.K., blah, 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 blah. No, come on, guys. They instituted yield curve control. The Bank of England, when push came to shove, was like, whoa, we're going to buy a bunch of uh, uh, guilt. So what I would say is that that's why the late 40s, early 50s are a better model for what's happening today. Because in the 70s, we didn't have as much leverage, right? In the 70s, we didn't have as much leverage. So Volcker could like beat his chest and like, you know, 600 basis points, blah, blah, blah. Oh my God, it's going to happen again. Hell no, that's not going to happen again. In the late 1940s, though, we, do ha we did have debt. Uh, you know, from World War II. And the way we dealt with it is we just allowed this inflationary overshoot. And that's why I'm saying like going from four to 2% will be so painful, so calamitous. People are going to lose their jobs. The government's going to default. Like, why would we do it? We're just going to be like, eh, four to 5% inflation for the next three to four years. Let's, let's roll with it. Um, and so we just got to get ready for that because I think that's, that's the way we're going to resolve the leverage. Cause you're right. It wasn't just the GFC where the private sector gave the debt to the public. It was also COVID COVID. The same thing happened, like even more so. So I, I see no way. I mean, I think all of this is just chest beating. I think the fed and other central banks are trying to preserve credibility, but eventually they are going to re-anchor inflation to 4%. We will have a new CPI target. It's not going to be legislated. It's not going to be announced. There's not going to be a nice statement about it. They're just going to be okay with it. You know, there's that famous uh, Donald Rumsfeld quote where he talks about the known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. Um, and obviously, we don't, we really don't know what the unknown unknowns are because we don't know what the unknowns are. But I'm wondering, like, in your mind, like, what, is there anything that we're, that the markets aren't paying as much attention to that maybe they should be, I mean, outside of Russia and China, those are the headlines, right? But what, what else is there that, you know, is in the back of your mind that the market should be paying attention to? So I think, uh, you know, I mentioned it very briefly at the beginning. I think it's um, situation in the Middle East. Um, and I think that Iran is reaching a point where they just can't, you know, they just can't take the ambiguity anymore. They've been waiting. I would, I would argue quite patiently for a decade to get the U.S. to the negotiating table. Um, and they keep getting these setbacks. And every time there's a setback, the Europeans come over and say, like, cool it, relax. You know, Donald Trump will lose. Don't worry. Americans will come back. Americans come back. Joe Biden shows up. Then the Iranians overplayed their hand earlier this year in 2021. They, like, delayed. They tried to get a better deal. Now it's over. There's no deal coming. I don't see how you make a deal with Iran at this point. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The U.S. is clearly trying to carry Saudi Arabia's favor. I think the media got it completely wrong. Joe Biden didn't fail when he went to Riyadh. Saudi Arabia didn't abandon the U.S. Saudis are just extremely intelligent and they're great at bargaining. They gave Joe Biden a shopping list and he's trying to like take it off. You know, that's like it, the Saudis gave America a scavenger hunt and the Americans are now trying to complete it. And you're seeing it in the news flow, like with the U.S. doing a lot of pro-Saudi things. One of the things on that scavenger list and the shopping list is probably don't do a deal with Iran. So that's one problem. The second problem is you have a very hawkish government that's just came to power in Israel that's done waiting. And the final problem is that the revolution in, in Iran happening right now is a revolution led by gender equality. So how does a liberal democratic president pull a Nixon go to Iran and make a deal? I mean, he will be crucified on Twitter. So... What I'm trying to say is that there's so many directions on which negotiations are done. And I just think Iran can't take that. I think Iran is going to have to do something about that. Lash out. Increase the cost of Western um, ambivalence. You know, and how do you do that? 
you incite conflict in the Middle East and then place yourself as a key negotiator. So what I worry about is a civil war in Iraq emerging or um, somewhere else. But, you know, and Iran basically going to the West and saying like, look, if you guys want us to help out with this, you know, you're going to have to give us some something. Uh, that's what I worry about. I think the next 12 months, the current disequilibrium in the Middle East is unsustainable and it's going to break somehow. And it's not on the front pages. Now, it's not not on the, the media. Like, so I didn't give you really something that's completely out of left field. People are worried about this, but I think that we're so obsessed with China and Ukraine, we're missing this piece of the puzzle. The second thing I would say is that Russia has a history of failing in its offensive operations and in having revolutions. So I worry also about domestic stability in Russia. Now, most people would cheer some sort of a revolution in Russia, but, you know, we need commodities. We need a lot of commodities. And having political risk in a country like Russia, which supplies the world with massive amount of commodities, would simply like light another inflationary match that I don't think, you know, major economies need. So instability in Russia, even though it might be satisfying on a normative moral level to most people listening to this podcast, I think will be negative for the world. You know, even though we're kind of ending here on those risks, I think one of the things that I appreciated about this conversation is it wasn't, it wasn't all risks. It wasn't all bearishness. It was, you know, a nice balanced, you know, risk and opportunities. Like you said before, macro is not just what the risks are. That's important. But, you know, where those opportunities lie currently and where they're going to uh, be in the future, possibly. So, well, you know, Justin, if I can leave you with something, I just think that my book, you know, really tries to make an uh, make a case that geopolitics is just one of the tools in our toolbox, like technical analysis. Technical analysis is not bearish. It's not bullish. It just is. Valuation, like being a value investor is not about being bearish or bullish. It's just about being an investor. Using geopolitics, like we need to understand that it's going to reveal opportunities and risk. It's just one of those tools. And I don't want to make a claim it's the most important tool in our toolbox, uh, but it's just one so, uh, you know, we have a standard closing question, which is based on your research and experience in the markets. If you can impart one lesson to your average investor, what would that be? And basically, I want to take what I just asked you and put it right in front of what you just said, because that's probably the response that I'm going to get. But if there's anything else that you want to add, please feel free. There is. So, yes, like adding geopolitics to the toolbox, you know, that we like, like our lunch bail, our toolbox we take to our construction site, like that's important. But how do you do that? as an investor. And so this is my biggest issue that I want to impart. Um, when we analyze a company, you know, when we try to figure out if you should invest in stock A or stock B, we tend to ignore what CEO of that company says. We have an adversarial relationship with management of firms as investors. You know, you don't sit on a CEO quarterly call and go like, oh my God, this is awesome. You're like, wait a minute, I, I need to analyze the truth behind this. We approach every decision we make as investors in a very um, normatively neutral manner. We're trying to eke out the truth. You have to do the same with investing, uh, with geopolitics. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that when you walk through the door and you sit in front of your Bloomberg terminal, you really have to stop being an American or a Chinese or a Japanese. As geopolitics becomes more and more relevant in our, in our, in our, in our profession as investors, you have to understand that your biases of countries you like or don't like or this or that, they really have to be put on the sideline. Now, obviously, as a human being, as a voter, you may want to vote for an aggressive foreign policy towards this country or that country. Like, that's fine. You can remain, you can be a human being in your real life. But professionally, especially if you have a fiduciary duty, you have to approach geopolitics in a cool, unbiased manner. I call it being bathed in nihilist indifference towards what's happening. And that's going to be the biggest challenge for investors. It's not going to be like learning history or learning how Italian parliament works relative to the French, like that stuff. You can, you can hire me. I can show up in your office and I can do that stuff for you. What I can't do for you is I can't make you approach these issues in a calm, collected, analytical fashion. And it's always fascinating to me how investors still put a premium on advice and, and, and thoughts of former policymakers or people who were in the know. It's like, would you, talk, would you hire a former CEO of a tech company to be your TMT analyst? Hell no. You would hire someone who's a professional investor who knows how to analyze companies. We need 
this industry to professionalize is geopolitical analysis. And I think we, we reach out too much to a past expiration date policymakers who are not actually going to have the same interest as we do as investors. And so that's the final thing I would say. It's, it's a very difficult thing. I don't know how people get over it, uh, but just approach your politics the way you do everything else as an investor in an analytical, non-biased manner. Good stuff. Thank you very much, Marco. I think, um, you know, we'd love to have you on again in the future, maybe even do this like once a year where we, your thoughts and views on, uh, you know, everything that's going on in the world, but we appreciate all your time today. And, uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. No, thank you guys. I really appreciate the platform. Hi, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of excess returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at practical quant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carbono. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.